What I'm going to talk about in this video is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or LSST for short. It's a very large telescope. Its main mirror is 8.4 metres in diameter, and it's being built up in the mountains in Chile. I'm going to talk about some of the amazing science that this telescope is planning to do, but I'm also going to talk about the threat to this science by the Starlink satellites. The telescope is located at Cerro Pachón in Chile at an altitude of 2,700 metres. At this high altitude, the amount of water in the atmosphere is very low. And being relatively close to the equator at only 30 degrees latitude, the telescope can see most of the northern sky as well as the entire southern sky. In fact, there are many other large telescopes in Chile. And at Cerro Pachón itself, there's Gemini South, which has an 8.1 metre mirror, and the SOAR telescope, which has a 4.1 metre mirror. Because of the lack of water in the atmosphere, these telescopes also work at infrared wavelengths. And here's a view of Cerro Pachón itself. Fantastic clear blue skies, absolutely no clouds whatsoever. That's every amateur astronomer's dream. Well, the telescope and the observatory are still under construction, and this is an artist's impression of what it's going to look like when it's finished. The telescope has a three mirror design, which is becoming more common in larger telescopes. The main mirror, M1, which collects the light, is ring shape. It has an outer diameter of 8.4 meters, and an inner diameter of 5.1 meters. This gives it the same collecting area as a telescope which had a mirror 6.7 meters in diameter. The secondary mirror is convex. It's 3.4 meters in diameter and it's actually the largest convex mirror ever made anywhere in the world. The tertiary mirror which focuses the light to the camera is made from the same piece of glass as M1. And you can see there also the hole in the secondary mirror, M2, that holds the camera body and all the sorted electronics. I just love this picture. It shows the primary and tertiary mirrors just after they've been cast from the same piece of glass. Absolutely amazing. Well, here's the camera. It has a resolution of 3.2 gigapixels. That's 3,200 megapixels. And it's the largest digital camera ever constructed. It weighs almost three tons and is the size of a small car. The size of its area covered by its detectors is 3,200 square centimeters which is an absolutely enormous area for a digital camera. And it's this large detector size which gives this telescope an exceptionally large field of view, FOV, of three and a half degrees. And that's roughly seven times the width of the moon. It's the large FOV which enables the telescope to survey the entire sky every three nights. The massive light collecting area, 35 square meters, and the sensitivity of the detectors which are cooled to minus 130 degrees Celsius to reduce noise, means that their images will be very deep, as well as covering a large area of sky. And by deep, I mean you can see very faint objects. In a pair of 15 second exposures, it can detect compact objects of 24th magnitude. That's roughly 16 million times fainter than you can see with the naked eye. So the telescope is equipped with filters to restrict the wavelengths of light coming in to a particular range. In the table there, the numbers are given in nanometers. And for interest, visible light has a wavelength range from 380 to 740. So you can see that the in that table, the U band is, is mainly ultraviolet, wavelengths shorter than visible light. 
and the Z and Y band filters are longer than visible light, so they are well into the infrared. Now the telescope has an automated filter changing mechanism, which you can see in this animation. And the beauty of this is it greatly speeds up the amount of time it takes to switch from one filter to another. Without this, it would take a considerable amount of time to move from one filter to another. The LSST follows on from a long tradition of sky surveys, which date way back to 1780s when Charles Messier catalogued 110 faint objects and he'd taken these with his small four inch telescope in Paris. That's an instrument which um, most amateur astronomers would have a bigger instrument than that today. Other notable sky surveys include the Palomar Sky Survey, which was done in the early 1950s, and the Sloan Survey, which was started about 10 years ago. There was a major renaming in January 2020. The observatory is now called the National Science Foundation Vera C. Rubin Observatory or just the Rubin Observatory for short. It's named after Vera Rubin, who studied the rotation curves of galaxies and played an important role in the discovery of dark matter. The telescope is called the Chimonier Survey Telescope, and it is named after Charles Chimonier, who donated $20 million of his own money to the project. It's worth going through a few of the key milestones of the project. It was first proposed um, more than 22 years ago, back in 2001. It took 13 years to secure the funding, a total cost of around about half a billion dollars in 2014 dollars, of course. The large mirror was complete in 2015 and took seven years to build. Construction at the site started in 2015. The mirrors were moved up there in 2019, but unfortunately, like a lot of things, construction was put on hold due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Looking forward, um, it's planned to have first light on the telescope in July, 2024. The observations will start January of the following year, that's 10 years after the main mirror was completed, and the first data release is due later on that year. And of course, all of these deadlines are subject to change and, and, and may well slip. One key scientific objective is to understand more about cosmology, to find out more about dark energy and dark matter. It can measure weak gravitational lensing, where light from distant objects is bent around a massive nearby object, changing their size and position. A large statistical survey is ideal for showing this effect. There's an unevenness in the distribution of galaxies caused by oscillation in the early universe. And this means that galaxies are more likely to be found at a distance of roughly 500 million light years from each other than if the distances were truly at random. When a white dwarf explodes in a type 1a supernova, it releases an enormous amount of energy in a short time totally destroying the star and blasting a cloud of plasma out into space. Because the detonation of the white dwarf occurs at a particular mass, all type 1a supernova tend to have a similar maximum brightness, although this varies a little. The American astronomer Phillips derived a formula to accurately estimate the maximum brightness of a type 1a supernova based on how it's apparent brightness declined over 15 days 
Once the absolute brightness of a type 1a supernova is known, its distance can then be calculated from its apparent brightness. This is vital for cosmological studies. Another scientific objective is cataloguing small solar system objects. Amongst these are near-Earth asteroids, where by cataloguing we mean not only their size and position, but by the change in the position, work out their orbits as well. This is of particular importance because potentially some of these objects could pass close enough or even hit the Earth, causing massive damage. It will also catalogue Kuiper belt objects. So these are objects which are in the solar system but well beyond the orbit of the outermost planet Neptune. There's a whole cloud of these and because of their distance and their faintness they haven't really been very well catalogued up until now. So that's something the LSST will definitely change. Another key scientific goal is to map and measure the Milky Way. The telescope will catalogue more than 10 billion stars and with its ability to of see in the infrared, it can observe stars in the dust layer, providing information on star forming regions within the galactic disk. In two 15 second back to back exposures, the LSST can detect RR Lyrae stars as well as Novae almost to the distance of the Andromeda galaxy. These objects are standard candles whose absolute brightness can be determined. Comparing how bright they are to how bright they appear gives an accurate estimate of their distances and with that knowledge the extent and structure of the galaxy can be measured. The LSST will enable astronomers to study a large number of objects which change in rapidly in brightness over a relatively short time. These so-called transient optical events include novae, supernovae, objects associated with gamma ray bursts and the change in brightness of quasars. Plus of course the exciting possibility of new discoveries. As many of you will know, SpaceX have been launching Starlink satellites in batches of 60 at a time. They've appeared as bright trails across the sky after launch before they break up into higher orbits. The purpose of these satellites is to provide worldwide fast internet coverage. And it's not just Starlink, there's also OneWeb Amazon's Project Kuiper and Telesat's Lightspeed at the moment and I'm sure over the forthcoming years more companies will answer this market. To put these numbers in perspective, at the end of 2019, before these constellations were launched, there were only 2,200 operational satellites in Earth orbit. In May 2020, the Rubin Observatory put out the following statement. However, despite various reports in the media, at the moment, the most accurate thing to say is that the effect of these satellite constellations on the LSST isn't known. The Rubin Observatory teams are working with SpaceX to find ways to lessen the impact of satellite trails. Efforts such as designing fainter satellites, improving image processing algorithms so they can better deal with satellite streaks and improving the telescope observation schedule based upon the knowledge of where the satellites will actually be may well provide additional mitigation. 
it will be a case of watching to see what happens over the next five years or so.